All right, it's 11.34, so let's get started. My name is Ray Phelps. I'm a policy and data research analyst at the New York City Campaign Finance Board. I use they, them, or she, him pronouns. Please use my pronouns. They're important to me. And thank you so much for attending this presentation. I just wanted to start off for, with a few thank yous. Thank you to Beta NYC and School of Data for hosting today's event and allowing me to present. Uh, thank you for the New York City chapter of the Internet Society for recording today's presentation. Just so you all know, you are being recorded. So if you're not comfortable with that, um, it's okay to leave today's presentation. And thank you to my coworkers here, uh, Jamie Anna, it's working towards Baker from Luigi Claud. Um, they're great, and thanks for all that you do for the CFB, as well as everyone else in the CFB who does great work to uphold the democracy in Kara City. Okay, so just a quick outline of today's presentation. So I'm going to start out with a brief overview of our agency and talk a little bit about the public funds matching program that we run and the post-election report, which is a report on campaign finance that we publish every four years. And then for the second half of the program, I'm gonna talk and preview, talk about and preview the data that we use to conduct our analyses on campaign finance in the New York City elections. And then at the end of that, we'll have time for some Q and A if anyone has any questions. Okay, so just starting out, what is the New York City Campaign Finance Board? So we're a nonpartisan independent agency that's tasked with administrating New York City's campaign finance program. And our mission is to increase voter engagement and participation. We do this through the New York City Votes Initiative, as well as inform the public about candidates and election. We also have a public funds matching program that serves to reduce barriers to running for city office and enhance the role of small contributions in funding campaigns. And finally, we conduct comprehensive post-election audits that diminish the corrupting influence of money in city elections. So just a little bit more about our public funds matching program. So there's a two-part threshold in order for candidates to receive public funds that match at an eight to one ratio the, number, the amount of contributions that they receive from New York City residents. So first they have to receive a certain number of contributions from the area that they represent. So for city council candidates, that's a certain number of contributions from the district that they re represent. For borough president candidates, that's a certain number of contributions from the borough. And then for mayor, public advocate and comptroller advocates, that threshold is for any New Yorker in the city. Um, and then second, they have to receive a certain dollar amount from the area that they represent. And as we can see on the chart here, uh, that threshold varies based on office. City council candidates only need to receive $5,000 in public funds from at least, sorry, not in public funds, $5,000 in contribution from at least 75 council district residents in order to be eligible to participate in our matching funds program while mayoral candidates need to receive at least $250,000 from at least 1,000 city residents to be eligible to participate. And finally, there is a cap on the total amount of public funds that is available to each candidate, and that ranges from $184,000 in public funds to a little over $7 million for mayoral candidates. So every four years uh, after the city elections, we produce a comprehensive uh, report on campaign finance activity in the last election cycle. Uh, so we just put out a report in 2021. You can access it on our website. And in the 2020 round report, we focus primarily on four areas. First time payees, which are candidates who received public funds for the first time in 2021. New York City Votes Contribute, which is a free online credit card processing platform that we offer to candidates running for elections for public office. Independent expenditures, which is outside spending by entities that did not coordinate with candidates in raising, in raising funds um, and producing advertisements. And finally, the post-election audit and enforcement process. So for an, our analysis on first-time payees, we looked at whether um, campaign finance outcomes differed for people who were receiving public funds for the first time in 2021 
compared to candidates who had received public funds in previous election cycles. And we found that there was about an even, even playing field, which is a great thing. So first time payees and program veterans received about the same amount of contributions, spent about the same amount, and about the same percentage of them qualified the public funds and reached the maximum. Um, second, for our analysis on New York City votes contribute, um, we analyzed the effectiveness of the platform and we found that the platform is working as intended. So just over 90% of candidates in the 2021 election cycle used our credit card processing system. And we also found that candidates who received more contributions through our platform were also less likely to commit a, a contribution related violations to CFB rules or the Campaign Finance Act, which suggests that our platform is aiding in candidates complying with CFB rules and, campaign, and the Campaign Finance Act. Uh, next, our analysis of independent expenditures found that there's been a dramatic increase in digital spending in the last few years. So that is likely not only due to the COVID-19 pandemic, but just the changing nature of advertisements for candidates. Um, yeah. And finally, we did an analysis of post-election audit and enforcement, and we found that around 40% of candidates received at least one violation for violating campaign finance laws. And finally, in our section on policy and legislative recommendations, we made two recommendations. The first was to prohibit foreign entities for contributing to ballot proposals, to spending on ballot proposals. And the second was to prohibit cryptocurrency donations to candidates. Okay, so now moving on to our data. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the formal definition of contributions, and then I'm going to do a preview of the contributions data set that we have available both on our website and on the open data portal. I will say now I recommend accessing our data on our website just because it's updated more frequently. We don't have automatic updates set up right now for the open data uh, portal. So a contribution is any gift, subscription, advance, or deposit of money, or anything of value made in support of a candidate. So funds to candidates is, of course, a contribution. But also, if you give a candidate, say, a laptop, that counts as a contribution, and it counts toward our contribution limits. Uh, candidates can accept contributions from any U.S. citizen or permanent resident, political committee, union, or social proprietorship but they are not allowed to accept contributions from corporations, LLCs, LLPs, or partnerships. And if they receive contributions from those sources, they're required to immediately refine them. She's sorry for recording. Yeah, it should be recording. Yep. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, and then finally, um, we have our contribution limits here, and we can see that program participants have a lower contribution limit well, sorry, than non-participants. Um, so candidates running who elect to be in our public funds financing program, they agree to have a lower contribution limit. Okay, so now I'm going to show our data. So just, I should quickly show just how to access it. Just go to our homepage. And then under follow the money, it's under analysis, data library. And we're gonna look at contributions data from 2021. Can I have a sit question? Yeah, totally. Is the contribution limit include the, those funds that they raised for the public fashion? It does not, that's just per contributor. Okay. Yeah. And it, yeah, it doesn't include the public funds. Great question. Okay. All right, so this is what the data looks like. So when we're analyzing anything related to contributions to candidates, regardless of whether that's a monetary contribution or an in-kind contribution, that's the contributions that take the form of a gift to a candidate, like a laptop or anything similar. This is the data that we use. Um, so as you may have seen in the previous screen, uh, we have a different data set for each election cycle. 
So this is the election variable, but we only have the 2021 election cycle here. I'm just going to add a filter really quickly so that I can show some of the, the variables here. And then I'm also going to pull up, um, hang on a second. Sorry. Um, a key that I created for the data sets. We also have a key available on our website, but this is just a little bit cleaner. Sorry, let me get the solder right in. Okay, so the next variable we see is Office CD. So for the 2021 data set only, you'll see candidates that have a single digit Office CD or a double digit office code. And this refers to what public funds program they opted into, which is, I know, a little confusing. This is only a thing for the 2021 data. But for candidates with double numbers, those are candidates who opted into the 2021 version of our public funds program. They could have public funds matched in an eight to one ratio. Candidates with single digit numbers for their office code, they either opted into our old program, which had a lower public funds matching rate for a higher contribution limit, or they were a non-program participant. Uh, so candidates with an office CD of one or 11, those are mayoral candidates. Two or 22 public advocate candidates, three or 33 comptroller candidates, 444 for a president candidates, five or five, 55 city council candidates, and six or 66 is undeclared or unknown. Next, we have the recipient ID. So this is an ID that is unique to each candidate. Each candidate receives a unique recip ID. And we never repeat them in different election cycles. So one thing that you can use this variable to do is join all of our different data sets. So if you're interested, for example, in like a correlation between the number of contributions that a candidate receives and the number of expenditures they make, you can use this variable to join those two data sets, the contribution data set and the expenditures data set. So the next variable here is the candidate class. So this tells us whether the candidate is a participant in our public funds program or a non-participant or a limited participant, which is a candidate who joins the program but entirely self-funds their candidacy. Those candidates can't receive public funds or if their class is so far undetermined. This is just the name of the candidates. This is an ID variable for the candidates committee. This is the filing period that the contribution was made under. You can see the different filing periods here. Candidates are required to submit a disclosure statement for each filing period, which discloses the contributions that they received and the expenditures they made. Next, we have our schedule code. So this tells us whether the uh, row in the status size is a monetary contribution, an in-kind contribution, a receipt adjustment, um, or liability and advance. We usually just work with monetary contributions. That's usually what we report. And just something to be aware of, as you'll see when we get to the contribution announce, is that this data set does include both contributions themselves and refunds. Um, so if you're interested in filtering out refunds, like that's something that you should do for what we're on the data set. Um, this is just a page number on the disclosure statement. I'm going to skip over that. A reference number associated with the transaction. This is the date that the contribution was made. We have a refund date if the contribution was refunded. So this is the name of the person or entity making the contribution. Here, the contributor code tells us whether the contributor was an individual, a corporation, which again, any contribution from a corporation needs to be funded, a labor union, the candidate's family, LLC, partnership, candidate committee, political action committee, party committee, the candidate's spouse, um, or other or unknown. We have address information for contributors, but I'm just gonna skip over that for privacy reasons. Um, but this is important. We have both the city, the city, the borough, and the state that the contributor comes from. So if you're interested in doing any analysis on contributions by locations, we do have those variables as well as zip code. 
We have the occupation of the contributor, but unfortunately this isn't like formalized in any way. The candidate or the contributor, sorry, the contributor can write down their occupation or choose not to. So it would be very difficult to claim this data. I can just look through and it, we have not attempted to claim this data and it, it would be pretty difficult. Um, and then just address of the place of work. This is the amount of the contribution. And like I mentioned before, for refunded contributions, we both have the original contribution itself and the refund. This is the amount of the contribution that's eligible to be matched. So you can see here, there's a lot of contributions that are uh, not eligible to be matched by our public funds program. And then a lot of contributions as well that are able to be matched. And we can just go through a few of these contributions and identify why they weren't eligible for public funds. Um, so for the first one, if we scroll through, we can see that this contributor is not a New York City resident. They're from PA. So that's why their contribution was not able to be matched with public funds. Um, for this contributor, um, you can see it's the same thing. They reside in New York State, but not in New York City. Um, and uh, additionally, we can see this candidate in their public funds are able to match because they're in New York City residents. Uh, and just one thing to note, if the contribution exceeds $175, um, regardless of if this is a single contribution or just the total amount that a contributor has donated, uh, that no, nothing more than 175 can be matched. Um, so here we, yeah, we have the matchable amounts. This is the previous amount that the contributor had donated. And this is the pay method. Um, contributors are allowed to contribute to candidates by cash, check, credit card, money order, and then three just encompasses all other pay methods and zero is unknown. Um, the next columns are information about intermediaries, which we're going to go through a little bit in later in this presentation because we also have a separate data set for intermediaries. And I'll go through what those are as well. And yep, this is just an indicator for if the contribution was made to a candidate in a runoff. And this is an indicator variable for the contribution was made to a bank account that's segregated from the committee's bank account. Um, okay, so moving back to the presentation. Next, we're going to go through our expenditures data set. So just a quick preview on what expenditures are. So expenditures are any goods or services that a candidate receives to further their campaign. Um, regardless of whether that's um, uh, something that the candidate paid for or whether it's something that they received. So in-kind contributions not only count as contributions, but they also count as expenditures and they're in our expenditures data set. Um, so program participants are subject to the spending limits that we see in this chart here um, that range based on the office that they're running for and the election itself. Um, but people who do not elect to participate in our program are not subject to spending limits. However, if a candidate who's a program participant has an opponent who's spending a high amount, um, they are eligible for the spending limit to be either raised or eliminated. Uh, and finally, some expenditures are exempt from spending limits. An example of this is childcare that's under $20,000. Um, just like School of Data presented, provided a free childcare, which is awesome for today's conference. Um, we allow candidates to spend on childcare for that to be exempted and spending on it. Uh, yeah, so then I'm gonna preview the expenditure data set. Okay. 
So I'm just going to skip over these variables because they're the same variables that we saw in the contributions data sets, office candidate ID, um, the candidate's class, the candidate's name, candidate committee, the filing period. Um, so for schedule and the expenditures data set, uh, this data set includes um, expenditures as well as in-kind contributions, which count as expenditures, uh, transfers, um, refunds, we have refunds in this as well, liabilities and advances, and candidates' personal political contributions. We have the invoice dates, as well as the date of the expenditure, the name of the person I'm um, sorry, not the person or entity making the expenditure. The name of the person or entity that the candidate um, spent on, purchased something from. We have a code for the expenditure, whether uh, this entity or person was a corporation, LLC, or individual. We have an indicator for whether they are an organization we have their address for the business or individual, the amount of the expenditure. Here we have a purpose code. So these are the different categories that we can identify what, a, what an expenditure falls under. So if you're interested in analyzing what exactly candidates are spending on, this is a column that you'd want to focus on. Um, campaign mailings, advance for payments, miscellaneous, political contributions, compliant costs, campaign consultants, constituent services, fundraising, interest expenses, campaign literature, non-qualified expenditures, office expenses, other petition expenses, polling costs, postage expenses, printing expenses, professional services, radio ads, office rent, television ads, unknown voter registration or campaign workers' salaries. This is just the purpose code written out. Uh, this is an explanation, a more specific explanation of what exactly was being purchased for this expenditure. It was posters, uh, and that's something that the candidate writes in. Okay, Zoom account is being signed in on another device. I guess I allow this. <laughs> Hopefully that was okay and school data is not being hacked <laughs> by uh, level one force. Okay. Um, exempt CD. So this is just an indicator variable for whether the expenditure is exempt from our spending limits. If it's something like child care, uh, legal fees, if another candidate brings a case against them alleging that they violated campaign finance laws or if they bring a case against another candidate or any costs associating with documenting their transactions for the CFP's auditing procedures. Again, a runoff indicator and the segregated indicator. Okay. Switching back to the data library. Okay, so now the intermediary data set. So an intermediary is anyone who the candidate either knows is soliciting contributions to their campaign or who delivers contributions to a candidate. So for an example, let's say a candidate knows that a person will call them Tim is going around to their coworkers, asking their coworkers to donate to the candidates. If the candidate's aware about them, they need to refer them as an intermediary. So here we just have a list of all intermediaries. We have the same information about the candidates that we have in our contribution and expenditures data sets. You're able to join this data set to any of those data sets. Um, and then we also have information about the intermediary themselves, their name, who they are, um, whether they're an individual corporation or fall under any of these other purpose codes. Sorry, C codes. Um, address information, 
and the amount that they intermediated. Excuse me, is that amount also listed under the contributors? Uh, yes, yes. So it's directed both places. Yeah, is that correct, Jamie? I believe it should be because it counts um, as a contribution. When they gather contributions of the intermediary, they should um, have information for each contributor as well. Right. Yeah. So in the contributions data set, you wouldn't see like these specific amounts because these are aggregated for how many contributions were intermediated. But in the contributions data set, you would see this broken down by contributors. Every contributor is required to be really question. Yeah. From like a citizen standpoint, what is the best use of like how to just conceptualize an intermediary and like how is it used then versus going to work now individualized? Um, do you, do you, so from a candidate perspective or, or from like a storytelling perspective where it seems like uh, like the intermediary, is that an official designated status? Like you need to register as an intermediary than this or do you, and it just be like, you like mentioned somebody in the hot office at the hallways and they happen to interview you and it's like, okay, now I need to do this. Yeah. How do you conceptualize just when somebody wants to look at the individualized or the after the admitting to how does that fit along spirit time? That's a great question. So I think the first distinction is that, you know, if you just like ask your coworkers to donate to a campaign and it's kind of offhand, you're not going to be an intermediary because uh, an intermediary is someone who the candidate knows for a fact is soliciting contributions or who directly delivers the contributions to them. Um, so, yeah, we wouldn't want to think like from a storytelling perspective of just like, if we're if we're on easy to tell a story about you know like people who are just donating to campaigns or who are very politically active and may you know like tell their friends and family about certain candidates like that's not what we're going to conceptualize as an intermediary. Um, so we actually full disclosure we did not do any analysis on intermediaries for the 2021 post election reports, or I think like any previous post election report since what, like 2000? Either 2013 or 2017. Yeah. Some analysis, um, but we didn't find that it just did at all in 2021. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I guess that's what I'd say about that. Does that answer your question or do you have a follow up? Yeah. I, well, I'm just have, I'm trying to understand it too because it's interesting. Yeah. I, and I, I'm just wondering if that's a like, did you guys come up with intermediary as a category, or is this already something that's part of like the like, description and um, programming and dates thing? Which year you mean to, re to register, or is this like a data category as a Yes. So the intermediaries don't need to register themselves. Um, the candidate registers the inter reports who an intermediary is. So yeah, that, I think that would be a big burden if we like expected, you know, members of the public to like recognize they're an intermediary. Um, I think that would be great from a data reporting perspective if we knew, you know, like everyone who has solicited contributions from people that they know. But it, we only have information on people that the candidate reports. And I suppose it's sort of on the honor system because if they're aware of someone who's soliciting contributions, they're required to report it. Um, so this is like particularly packs with one of those points. It's a yeah. group that yeah. actively arises to support their campaign. And that's the kind of thing you want to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. But not necessarily a pack because if someone's spending on a candidate but isn't coordinating with the candidate, that's not, that's not a contribution. That, that's considered the independent spender. Um, it's only like groups that are like soliciting contributions on a candidate's behalf. Yeah. Okay. So, so it has to be funds that go back to that candidate account, right. not necessarily an intermediary alliance that spends. Exactly. Right. Yeah. If the, and right, if the alliance is spending themselves, that's not an intermediary. Of course, yeah. Okay. So next, we're going to look at our public funds data set. So this data is actually aggregated 
by candidate. We don't have individual public funds payments available. It's just the total amount of public funds that each candidate received. So that's an important distinction because the previous data sets that you saw were not aggregated by candidates. That's something that you need to do yourself if you're conducting analysis and you're interested in candidate level sets. Um, but this is a candidate level data set. We have the same information on the candidates that we saw in the previous data sets. Um, and then we have the amount of public funds broken down by early payments, primary payments, general payments, runoff payments, and then the total amount. Early payments are any payments that were given out um, in filing periods before the ballot is finalized. Um, okay, so then finally, financial analysis. So this is just a small preview of some of the stats that we calculate and analysis that we do um, and things that you'd be able to recreate on your own if you'd like to or add to. Um, so this is just, these are the statement numbers. So it's just saying that this is data from statement one to 15. This is also a candidate level data set. Um, and we have the borough or district of the candidates whether they terminated their campaign. The incumbent indicator, unfortunately, is in filling in, in this data set. Uh, the number of contributors that donated to their campaign, number of contributions, uh, the contribution amount, total contribution amount they received, the amount that was matchable, number of intermediaries, number of intermediary contributions, the amount that intermediaries intermediated number of small contributions, um, the amount of small contributions that are received, um, the amount of public funds payments the candidate received, expenditures, candidate's participation class, the number of uh, maximum contributions that they received, um, the amount that they received that were maximum contributions, that it, it met the limit, their contribution limit, um, any outstanding bills, yeah. And that's all for our data library. Um, so then I also wanted to show another way of accessing the data. That's just, you can get a little bit more of a niche picture. So if you go to follow the money and then you go to follow the money search. So it's just right at the top of the screen. It disappeared on me. I think, okay, okay, okay. Okay, sorry about that. It should work here. Or, yeah. So you can enter a candidate name or a contributor name and you can decide whether you want to include contributions made role to candidates and independent spenders, which are spenders who are spend who are not coordinating with candidates but spending on their campaign. Um, and if you don't put anything into these boxes and you just press search, and we have we have this under contributions. Then you can see something that's like very similar to what I showed you before in our data library. If you download the Excel file, it'll actually be identical to what was in the data library. Um, you can filter by election cycle. You can even look at financial activity for ballot proposals. You can filter by office. Uh, contributor type, whether they're an individual, an organization, and what specific kind of, of organization, even the employer of the contributor. If you want to do any analysis with employers, this is what we want to do because it's completely unstructured in the data library. Um, whether the contributor is in New York City, outside New York City, even their zip code, you can set a minimum and maximum amounts of contributions. You can look at monetary contributions, in-kind contributions, or refunds. An account type. And which disclosure statement or filing period you want to look at. And then you can download it as an Excel, a PDF. 
I wouldn't recommend downloading as a PDF, but you are able to do that. Um, and then this is a, a key. So like similar to what I showed before, it explains each of the variables. And so we also have this for expenditures. You can filter by Furbis code, which I think is pretty interesting stuff. Intermediaries. And any other type of transaction that we have listed here. And then also, let me go back. Sorry, just click this. We also have data on independent spenders here, both contributions and expenditures made by independent spenders. Can filter election cycle. You can filter by the communication type that the spender spent on. Pay your vendor name, disclosure statements, and as well as whether the spender supported or opposed the candidates. In our post-election report, we found um, that there was very little opposition spending in the 2001 election cycle by independent spenders compared to previous election cycles. And we're not sure exactly why that is, but that was the case, especially in the mayoral race. Okay, so then the last thing that I wanted to show you guys is something that uh, my coworker, a superior, Jamie Anno, <laughs> our senior data scientist made, which is a dashboard of campaign finance data in the 2021 election cycle. Um, and you can access this by going to our website, clicking news and media at the top, then reports. This is also where you can access our post-election report. I'll do a little just like scroll through all of it just so you can get a, a quick little tease of it. Yeah, these are the contents. I'll read out a description of the dashboards in the meantime. So during the 2021 election, $126.9 million in public funds was paid to 308 candidates, matching nearly $18.3 million in contributions from New Yorkers. So the dashboards that I hope I'll be able to show you, if you have a laptop with you, you can feel free to access it. I assume it will work on local computers. People, laptops can be working for me like five minutes ago. I was preparing, but not sure. Um, but yeah, so they s visualize the data that I showed you all um, by both at the candidate level and at the district level. So you can click on a map like individual council districts and you can look at like total contributions, average contribution amount, uh, where the money is coming from, who the money is coming from. And it's all really cool. If you, um, if you think Google, and when I see votes to help public, you'll come on with our profile and then you can do the dash part. Correct. I don't know why I'm bringing her image. Uh, that's really great. So Jamie also made these maps. Um, and so you can look at average uh, primary campaign spending by council districts here. Um, IMCs, which these are invalid matching claims. So these are contributions that candidates submitted to the CFB to be matched by our public funds program, but we determined was ineligible for matching funds. Um, a fun fact in our analysis of New York City votes contribute, uh, the credit card processing platform that we offer to candidates, we found that candidates who received a greater percentage of their contributions through the platform received a fewer number and statistically significant fewer number of invalid matching claims. We can also visualize by council districts um, the percentage expenditures that were made to vendors in New York City. And we can see it's the outer boroughs and 
the upper Manhattan that have the highest percentages. And then we can also look at individual contributions by state. Let me zoom out. Yeah, this is going to a lot of zero. Yeah. So we can see there's actually a lot of, of states that had like essentially no, very few, under 5% um, of contributions came from them. But a lot of contributions came from California. Of course, the vast majority came from New York. Um, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, so thank you to everyone again. Thank you for coming, supporting our agency and the presentation. I hope you learned a lot about campaign finance in the 2021 election cycle. And I hope you take what you've learned and conduct your own analyses with the data if you feel so obliged. Um, and if you come across anything interesting, feel free to email us. Um, you can send us an email. And yeah, get in touch. Okay. okay. All right, question. Yeah, I have a couple questions. So, do you think there might be any way to structure the employer data and that for me? I remember I was searching for something specifically and I got so many different versions of the theater of employer. Yeah, I know it's tough. That's a good question. So, the answer is not really, I yeah. think. I'm also gonna, um, Allie over here is our director of policy and research. Or you guys can introduce yourselves because they can feel questions as well. Yeah, um, I'm Leanne on the senior data scientist. Um, I'm Sir Quinn's Baker, the governmental analyst. I'm Lizzie, another policy analyst. Um, um, well, thanks for the least about the director of policy and research. Thank you, fuck heads. You would love to dig up. Yeah. But the answer is no. <laughs> okay. So I have maybe a slightly more optimistic answer. Are you familiar with fuzzy matching at all? No. Like, okay. So there's something that you can do like in our studio. I imagine also elsewhere, but I primarily use our studio um, to like essentially like measure how many different like characters there are um, in like different like words. Uh, there's something called like the Leviathan distance where it's, it's formulaic. It's not just like the exact number of character, character difference. And like from that, you can identify whether the likelihood for which like those employers are like the same name, like referring to the same employer, um, that would be like the best way to write all the data would be using fuzzy matching. I think, unless, we have, um, yeah. Probably like far in the future, we're going to decenter our campaign finance database and um, hopefully make it your, um, like having a pre sale like employer from like, I don't know, a business database. Uh, oh, yeah. and, um, so that uh, people are just sort of like adding their text willy nilly and sort of like, um, uh, trying to structure it before it gets entered into the database, but that's like pretty far off, I would say. Yeah, um, I was also wondering if right during the election process, um, heavy workers are committed in the spending room, like to their wages, is that? Yes, yeah, that is, yeah. And that's the purpose code for that, I think is like, is CAMP, I think, C-A-M-P. Don't quote me on that. But yeah. the purpose quote that's specifically for wages. Yeah, so that's not something you'd need to do any fuzzy yeah, so you can do. Luckily, do have like a specific category, so you can yeah filter specifically by campaign workers' wages. Yeah. Um, so big picture question: How much is one hundred twenty-six point nine million in the grand scheme of campaign financing? In the grand scheme, okay, so it's. I wish I had the number off the top of my head. Ali, do you know how, or anyone else, how many times it is more than the number of contributions received? Wasn't it like in 2021, wasn't it like 40 million about contributions received? And then about how does it work? Was that count representative of total giving spending? Right, from all, you public know. Public money versus private money. Oh, yeah. Right, yeah. So, so you know, cuts and everything, unions and all that. We'll map up to 89% of the spending limit because we have spending limits. It's really nice in some way to know how much 
from the hemp staking place. So I would say it's probably 89% of the total amount of spending that is occurring in the election cycle because our participation rate is it's 96% of every candidate. Yeah. Yeah, and that's actually something that is um, visible on the dashboard that Jamie created yeah. at the candidate level. Um, yeah. So I wish I could show it, but check it out when you're at home. Yes. Well, you guys are showing the math data. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I, for you, if like, I missed some part of this, but in terms of the mashing or address we're from, I wonder if there's potentially an equity issue with the um, certainty of where people might live and they might have to have less venture turnover and how, you know, really may know where people's actual addresses are in the sense that they're, they're um, maybe just moving them out. How, how do you guys capture that as like over file or if something is inputting a credit card? Yeah. Did you actually take the credit card address or how do you know where to tag that person geographically? That's a great question. So for the voter file, um, if people upload their address with the DMV, or I believe also the National Registry, their address is going to be updated in the voter file. But yeah, that is up to an individual person. I will say, like, full disclosure, I forgot to update my address, and I had to, to vote with an affidavit ballot in one election. So that is something, obviously, that happens. Well, people forget to do that. And yeah, I think people really have less affluent neighborhoods might be moving more often. People are, like, by Saturday neighborhoods. And that's definitely that's something important that I hadn't thought about previously. In terms of addresses for our campaign finance data, that's self-reported. So that's at the time of the contribution itself. Um, we don't, I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, I guess probably in our contribute data set, we do have addresses, we don't have addresses associated with credit cards, yeah. right? So or, yeah, there's some that part input it yeah. uh, by either the computer or their intermediary. Yeah. Um, but um, we take those out of the public database. Yeah. Like, um, Otherwise, uh, the only thing that we really check, um, we have an auditing theme that checks if the address is a residential, um, uh, or is a residence, sorry. Um, and that's really the only thing that we check. Um, that it's in New York City and that it's a residence if they're like an individual. Um, because otherwise you can't be matched if you're not a resident. Yeah. If you're asking whether in the airway, it's probably priority places where there's like um, less stability, I guess, and like or new what housing, I think is something you come across pretty often. Yes, something um, fine that is the reason why it's not in the residential database that Jane's talking about. The likelihood is that your housing is like new, or well, you're living at a place where there is more likely to be. Um, housing that's not identified, um, like uh, I guess they're really fitting things will probably be um, places like illegal leave when a might not show on as residential addresses in our in residential database. So yes, that is. To be clear, they can for each to a given that we just can't match their exactly. Yeah. Right, right. And, yeah, and well, and I and I also just mean that to bring this up because it's something that I've been thinking a lot about where um, there's attention, right? And wanting to create fight fantasy and wanting to show where all the money is coming from, but in a dashboard, we've got our communities. And then I was just curious, like, how do you handle the DAF? The loop experience reality and then what Shannon kept in like data and then how you all are managing that on like the very instant that often the address and is not good. The voter files were out of date. That people could tend to yeah, be renters who live in New York every few years. They, uh, they, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think it's it's a difficult problem to avoid. I think, like, yeah, your question is, has sparked some interrogation in my mind and something I'll think about. So I think maybe that's something important for us to like list as a display in our reporting data. I think she went over there trying to geocode and yeah, and not need to write anything. Yeah, it's but definitely. Oh, you'll double. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. Yeah. 
in the contributor database for a contribution that gets um, refunded. So then, is there any indication on the row that lists the original contribution that it's been refunded? Yeah, so that'll be that'll be under receipt adjustments. It's Schedule M. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? It's just about all oh, fairly so. We can have one. Yep. <laughs> Hello. What was your favorite part of doing research for the book selection report? And oh. <laughs> okay, so this is like so niche and like might not be interesting to anyone but me, but I thought it was fascinating. So when I was doing an analysis of the New York City Contribute platform, the online credit card processing platform that we offer to candidates, um, we found that contributions through that platform were actually higher on average than contributions made through other credit card processing platforms like Act Blue. And that seemed like odd to us, you know, like I wanted to interrogate why that was the case. And I found out that there were substantially fewer $10 contributions coming through Contribute com compared to our expenditures. And I was like, huh, why would that be the case? And then I noticed on the Contribute platform that we don't currently have like a button for people to click to donate $10. That starts, that button starts at $25. Whereas like something like Act Flu, um, they have like that $10 option to click. So it's interesting. It goes back a little bit to like behavioral economics where like someone might actually like be less inclined to donate a certain amount simply because they have to type in that amount rather than clicking on a button. So uh, in the next election cycle, we're going to add a $10 default button. Candidates can like choose to add one themselves or like choose to have like their own. Um, contribution boxes, but the default doesn't include a ten dollar option, so we're going to add that. As I was an econ major in college, so that's very interesting. Thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad you did find it interesting. I didn't think anyone would. Okay, I think it's it should be it's twelve twenty eight. So if anyone has a last question, feel free to ask it. If not, we can end two minutes early. Ray, did you provide your oh, contact information anywhere? My contact information? Oh, I did not. I should do that. And then I could develop two questions. People want to ask you questions. Yeah. Okay. I'll just put, I, this is a weird way to put it, but. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's rphelps at nyccfb.info. Yeah. Feel free to send me any questions. I love answering questions. The map can't be financed data. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the question is uh, how likely is this to be implemented at the state level? Do you think have you guys been following that? So, the state does have a, our matching funds program. The state does have a matching funds program, actually. I think probably Ali or Hoop Turquoise, one of you guys could speak more about the state program. <laughs> yeah, so the state program um, is basically starting up this year. They've been holding a lot of, um, you know, some public, some friendly um, sessions about it. Um, a lot of it is inspired by the city model, um, but he said they're dealing with other food state um, candidates. A few things are are different, I think. I expect to see a lot of things <laughs> in the coming in the coming months as as things start to pick up. Um, but a lot of the things you see here, like contribution limits and like the amount of contributors that you have to add in order to be out of both the amount of done, there's like a lot of a lot of parallels. Um, but yeah, this will be the first year that there'll be a public monthly funds program. So we'll obviously be keeping an eye on it, but our farm there is still good. We're really going to have the safe it. Thanks, sir, guys. All right. We are out of time. Uh, well, okay, one more question. <laughs> this is a very big picture question. Yeah. I can think of like, obvious reason why it's important to have like a public matching bonus program of like it's just an equity issue of like you know um making sure everyone has at least every everyone who wants to um, participate in election wants to run as, as something to go on is there like what what is sort of like the broader um 
important is in the program like that. Totally. So yeah, I'd, I'd say that's probably like the primary rationale is to reduce barriers to running for city office. It's also to like diminish the impact of, you know, like independent spenders as well, not just to, you know, create a level playing field between candidates who can self fund their campaign. Um, but, you know, we also want, we don't want like independent spenders to be determining races. Um, does anyone, do either of you have something to add about the importance of the public funds matching program for Glenn's? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Ray really hit the nail on the head. I think it also, you know, gets the community more involved. So a lot of times, if you don't have any, you know, independent spending series, like you're not aligned in the whole South Asian process. A lot of the people who are on the ground will be impacted by the people who are on the ground. You know, lamp down. So I think that independent spending is like the Yeah, definitely. Um, um, it also, especially with the threshold and, you know, pushing candidates to have to get contributions from the communities that they're actually going to represent. We really want candidates to be meeting face to face with the people of their communities and getting contributions from them. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of um, different levels um, and qualifications in the matching funds program or to get candidates out there and meeting the people that they represent in their communities and getting money from them um, instead of trying to find larger donation sources that might not be coming from the communities that they're actually living in and they're going to be what they more. Is there, is there a way to assess the success of them? Like if of, of all of the aspects of like why why this is important. Yeah, that's something that we've been talking about and trying to figure out. Um, we did partially aim to do that with our analysis of first time pays. And I think we were like pleased to discover that there does seem to be like a level, level playing field among like candidates who are for the first time locked into our program, who may be running for the first time compared to candidates who have you know, been running in previous elections. Election cycles may be incumbents are program veterans. Um, Jamie, do you want to speak more to your research on that? Um, I think you said it uh, correctly. Um, I'll just say that um, over the years, we've seen an increase in small contributions, yeah. which is what we like to see um, in terms of um, the number of people giving to candidates um, and um, the sort of like uh, as they multiply their money. Um, um, people are more, um, the, uh, better to consider a candidate. Oh, they like it. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I have a quick comment on this. Uh, it kind of reminds me of our Richard Thaler's nudge. A period of behavioral economics. Yeah, it's really <laughs> it's simply yeah. publishing. I wrote a paper on nudge theory in, in college. I believe publishing this data is increasing the accountability yeah. and leads to better practices similar to corporations that if they're required to publish their carbon footprints, it will inevitably gain to feather things. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. I think I think we're like a little over time, so we'll be having food patient. Thank you so much everyone for coming. Have a great day. Enjoy the rest of the conference.